Hi, everybody. As promised, this is going to be a little tiny end of the last little bit of chapter 13 that we didn't get to yesterday in class. Just three slides. Um, and we're going to cover this material both for quiz seven and for the exam. Okay, so I'm gonna back this up here to, we had talked about being able to control ventilation um, and the stimuli that are regulating ventilation. And this figure is a flow chart that sort of combines what we were talking about with O2, CO2, and um, other non-CO2 acids, which we didn't talk about very much, but like lactic acid. So as I said, if the O2 in the arterial blood gets very, very low, then you'll start getting peripheral chemoreceptors firing. Also, having high arterial PCO2 or high lactic acid, both of those will lead to acids in the blood. So lots of protons as the acids dissociate, and the protons are the things that are picked up by chemoreceptors. So it's a separate chemoreceptor for the protons versus the oxygen. Both of them, though, will increase in firing under these conditions, either very, very low O2 or more protons in the blood, more acidity in the blood. Those action potentials are going to go to the medulla, where we were just talking about the fact that those medullary neurons regulate the automatic action potentials that are being sent to the diaphragm down the phrenic nerve. And so we get the medullary neurons for inspiration firing. And then we get action potentials down the neurons, down that phrenic nerve to the diaphragm and also down other nerves to the inspiratory intercostals. And then that is our contraction. That's gonna, those action potentials are gonna go through neuromuscular junctions, stimulate action potentials in the muscle cell membranes. These are all skeletal muscles, remember. And then we're gonna get contractions happening through excitation contraction coupling. And then we're gonna get an increase in the rate of ventilation and often the depth of ventilation too. Usually rate and depth go together. On this other part of the flow chart, if we get an increase in arterial PCO2, we can get more carbon dioxide around the brain. And so then also around the brain, through that reaction with bicarbonate, we can get more hydrogen ions. And so then the central chemoreceptors start firing. So we have the peripheral ones mostly located in the blood vessels, uh, and then we have the central ones that are actually in the brain. So when those start firing, again, they have connections to the medullary inspiratory neurons, which will increase their firing rate, which will increase action potentials down the neurons to the diaphragm and the inspiratory intercostals, will get contractions and will increase ventilation. So any one of these alone, as you can see, can increase ventilation. And then if you happen to have all three of them, of course, you're gonna stimulate re ventilation even stronger. And so you can see what we're trying to do is we're trying to protect the brain and we're trying to protect the rest of the tissues by, again, the main driver of this is to keep blood pH stable by keeping the CO2 levels at the appropriate levels. But then also, if you're in a situation like really, really high altitudes, or perhaps you're in a situation where you're trying to escape a fire and there's very low levels of oxygen, um, but because it's being taken out by the fire, you're not gonna have an increase in CO2 in that situation. You're just gonna have the decrease in O2. And if we have very low O2 that we're breathing in, we'll get an increase in ventilation rate to try to get more out of the air that's available. So in situations where we can't get enough oxygen, 
These situations are called hypoxia, so hypoxic, hypoxic, too low of oxygen. And there's a bunch of different ways you can have hypoxia. We've already talked about anemic hypoxia. So we don't have um, enough iron, enough hemoglobin. The hemoglobin may be there, but it's abnormal. We don't have enough red blood cells. All of this relates to the blood's ability to carry oxygen. So anytime the blood cannot fully saturate and carry enough oxygen, so either or, not enough cells to do it, not enough hemoglobin to do it, not enough iron in the hemoglobin to do it, then you're gonna have anemic hypoxia. Ischemic hypoxia is when the blood does not flow to a particular region. So for whatever region, reason, blood circulation is impaired. And a lot of times we think of ischemic hypoxia happening after a blood clot completely occludes a blood vessel. And then all the underlying tissue does not get blood delivery. So it doesn't get oxygen diffusing into those tissues. So then we have cell damage. Histotoxic hypoxia is when cells die, cells die from toxins, and the toxins are not allowing the body cells to use oxygen. So cyanide is a, a toxin that prevents the cells from taking up and utilizing oxygen. So you don't we don't have cyanide around very much anymore. Cyanide used to be used as a fairly common pest control, but then a lot of people died from it. Um, but you can also, <laughs> my botany professor told a story of how um, apple seeds have very, very small amounts of cyanide in them, you know, probably to prevent predators or herbivores from actually eating their seeds. They taste a little bitter. And so the herbivore spits them out and the seed survives. But he told a story of an old guy who loved apple seeds and he loved to eat them. And so one day he, he for his birthday, he saved up a whole bunch of apple seeds because he was going to give himself a big treat. And unfortunately, he consumed a large amount of cyanide and killed himself. And so that was his last birthday. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what my botany professor told me. There's also a type of hypoxia called hypoxic hypoxia, which just means you don't have enough oxygen. And this can be oxygen, you don't have enough arterial O2. So you can get it from, again, not being able to breathe oxygenated air, just like we were talking about in the flow chart, um, pulmonary problems that don't allow you to respire to the degree that you need to, to get enough oxygen into the alveoli, or that lack of ventilation perfusion coupling can also lead to hypoxic hypoxia. And then one last thing to think about is carbon monoxide poisoning. So carbon dioxide we have in large quantities and we produce it and it's definitely something that we can easily get, our, get out of our body. But carbon monoxide is instantly toxic and can cause death. It is a type of anemic hypoxia because what it does, and this is, this is the leading cause of death from fire, is it's going to compete with O2 for the binding sites on hemoglobin and it outcompetes them. It can displace O2 because it's got 200 times greater affinity for the hemoglobin than the O2 does. So we know that hemoglobin combine O2 and CO2, and O2 actually outcompetes the CO2. But CO, carbon monoxide, outcompetes the O2. And it's often a very hard thing to diagnose because you're lacking in oxygen, but people don't look blue. And normally we associate lack of oxygen with like a blueness and that's called cyanosis. And there's no cyanosis detectable because the cyanosis actually comes from when hemoglobin binds oxygen or carbon monoxide, it actually kind of curls around them. And the shape that it makes as it's loaded with oxygen appears red to our eyes. And when it's unloaded, it actually sort of flips open 
and that shape appears blue to our eyes. So you can see why we don't get cyanosis because it is bound like it is with oxygen, but only this time we have carbon monoxide being bound. So you actually get this cherry red skin. The skin actually looks really red. But what you're looking for is respiratory distress with red skin along with confusion because the brain is not getting enough oxygen. And the only way to treat it is to get into a hyperbaric chamber with 100% oxygen where you're increasing that partial pressure of oxygen so high that you're just kind of brute forcing, displacing the carbon monoxide. Whenever it pops off, because it will sometimes, then you've got a lot of oxygen to get in there and replace it. And you can also diffuse a little bit more oxygen into the blood itself when you're at that high of oxygen concentration. And that's it. We just had a few more slides to get to. I hope you have a great weekend studying. If you have any questions, make sure to hit me up on email. And I still have some time for appointments on Monday. See you later.